wanna go and get it. Go and get this ain't it. the secret, boy. I said it. I, this ain't I, the place for those nice settings. Those but is the fame much better? Cause they watch every move. Yeah. We must improve. This is simply unbelievable. You wade through the narrow, crooked passages in the slums, reach a shack, and its door is secured with a biometric lock. There are cameras scanning your face from the top down, reading your biometric data, watching you for any sign of malintent. There are warning signs everywhere, just like this one saying, beware, you are being filmed by a hidden camera. This symbiosis of a high-tech world and the slums in China is simply mind-blowing. Today, we'll be talking about a country where megacities spring up in a couple of decades with technology that is leaps ahead of the rest of the world. Do you hear the silence? This is the city center. There is absolute silence here, and that is because of the sheer numbers of e-vehicles operating on the road. Guys, this is the first high-speed subway I have ever traveled by. As the train picks up speed, my ears are seriously popping. Let's compare the most pricey European cars. Guys, this is a Maybach. <laughs> Check it out, the monitor's literally bending. With ordinary Chinese ones. Just listen to this. As if it's cemented. Not a single squeak how multi-million businesses are built in China. I made my first million before I was 30. And how they copycat technology. Guys, this is the first time I'm witnessing industrial espionage in the making. Let me show you. And of course, we'll show you the flip side of that coin. What are Chinese ghost towns? This is an abandoned place, or not exactly abandoned, rather never inhabited in the first place. Desolate. This should have been a store. How the world of Chinese counterfeits works. I brought you some souvenirs, of course. Guys, we made it ourselves. It looks and feels totally, totally like the real thing. And what the local slums look like on the inside. Welcome! That over there must be a toilet. Yes. That's the toilet, right on the... We'll delve into the real Chinese underground. They'll simply cut you up. Wow. And take all your shit. You have to understand, there are things you don't talk about on camera. Guys, we are in the most unusual area of Guangzhou. This is a black ghetto. I am Stas Natanzon, and I'm going to show you a China you've never seen before, for sure. Let's go. Guys, we're in the city of Guangzhou. This is not only a Chinese megacity, not only a megaport or a trade and economic center, but to some extent, Guangzhou is quintessential China. This city is the focal point of an incredible phenomenon. Several big cities all merged into one. Guangzhou itself, Shenzhen, Hong Kong, and Macau having created a mega, mega city that has everything. High tech, artisan factories, elite districts, and of course, slums. And today, by exploring Guangzhou, we'll try to understand what kind of a beast modern China is. Good afternoon, sir. 
<laughs> Just like that, as soon as you get out of the cab, they're offering you watch duplicates. That thing over there, guys, behind my back, is officially the world's largest counterfeit market here in Guangzhou. Let's go. Very good. Yeah. I've come to this shopping mall together with Artur, who recently relocated to work in China. Literally right in front of an enormous shopping mall, someone could come up and say, come with me, I'll sell you a whole bunch of fake stuff. This man's leading us somewhere to a warehouse. Guys, we are going down into some basement, and this is quite a basement, for real, with heaps and heaps of stuff. In these passageways, apart from the items, you'll come across something rarely seen in China, the homeless. Guys, this is something that's usually kept behind the scenes. As soon as I started rolling, this man behind me came up and started looking at me. Like he's been full on staring at me all the way, and he still is. Hello. There, all because he saw I was filming the homeless who are sleeping down here in the subway. When I tried to leave, the man started to follow me, already on the phone to someone. So this man is still following me. He's on my heels. There he is. Look, he's taking pictures of me. He's sending those pictures, calling somebody. All jokes aside, that scared the hell out of me. The man kept stalking me. At moments like this, your darkest fears swamp you. I wouldn't want to be grabbed by Chinese security service, especially when I know I've done nothing illegal. I don't know who that is, just a man in plain clothes. He saw that I was filming the homeless, and he started following me. But no matter how much I ran, the guy wouldn't get off my tail. He just keeps following me. Look at that. He just keeps walking. A man's following us. He's definitely following us. Yeah, yeah. Okay, let's go. After stepping into the street, I took an umbrella to be less recognizable. I was lucky it was raining, and there were lots of people around. All right, that's it, guys. I have to leg it for real now. That dude is on to me. No kidding. He didn't like what I was filming. I think he's a CIA agent or something. Well, not exactly a CIA agent, but what do they call them here in China? I don't know. If you've had to deal with something like this here in China, tell us in the comments. Did we lose him? Yeah, I think we did. I think we're good. He's bailed. He must have lost us in all the umbrellas. He was watching you and he took out his phone, and then we made off. When you said he was following us, I turned around and I saw him. Well, truth be told, that was creepy. Imagine a really jacked up bruiser following your every move. Then he starts chasing you for real. I go left, he turns left. I turn right, he turns right. I take the stairs, he does. Meanwhile, our guide didn't bat an eyelid and carried on to our destination. Guys, we are going to a genuine counterfeit joint. The real deal. Not all these markets, not all these shopping malls and stuff. The real deal. We are entering some sort of a showroom, and it's only us here. And it's packed with branded clothing. After seeing my camera, the seller shoves us out immediately. Finally, they brought us to some underground showroom. Okay, they don't want us to film it. All right, we're leaving. Okay, okay. So this is the place with the real prices. Okay, okay. Only here in these no tourist showrooms can you find truly high quality counterfeits at really low prices. We will make a separate overview of the global Chinese counterfeit market. Stay tuned and don't miss it. Our guide is taking us to another similar showroom. Come on. This is the first time I've seen a store with blurred showcases while the store itself is closed and only select customers are allowed. They brought us to God knows where. It's a totally unidentifiable location, a basement. And this is where they have the store. No. They also didn't let us in because of the camera. But after a fair search, we eventually were able to find someone willing to open their doors to us. Guys, this is a real private store. Balenciaga. They sell all sorts of fakes. Balenciaga. What's this? Givenchy. This is Burberry. In locations like these, they don't sell mass products with strings sticking out and poor seam work. These are Class A counterfeits. If you think that all this goes to cheap marketplaces and tourist flea markets, 
You're wrong. These counterfeits are sold in elite boutiques all over the world. In 2022, the owner of an elite boutique in the state of New York had to pay a $40 million fine for selling counterfeit Gucci's and Louis Vuittons. In 2023, the same thing happened in Australia. Sometimes the expensive boutiques are unaware that their shelves are filled with fakes. This is a U.S. court press release. In 2016, it sentenced this woman with a tricky name, Propitia Smutsorabad, who would buy original bags for thousands of dollars and then return fakes to the store and resell the originals. The stores couldn't tell the difference. That way, she managed to scam 60 points of sale and earned $400,000. However, the stores didn't suffer much as they still sold the returned items, believing them to be genuine. How's the quality? The quality is super as far as I can tell. Very thick material. Yeah, it's really thick. Real t-shirts. here, check this out. Well, I don't know. Uh-huh. Yeah, it's just like... I, for one, am not a big fan of the original, but... Oh, yeah. Perfect seams, absolutely. Unlike other low-quality fakes, counterfeits like these don't cost mere pennies. Here's a funny thing, guys. Check it out. The counterfeit store even has a chair like Louis Vuitton. It's like, I'm sitting on your brand. We'll return to that counterfeit market for souvenirs, but first, let's taste a completely different China. Are you filming this? Yeah. So guys, you are witnessing a historic moment. I'm trying to pay with cash at a cafe in China. Don't do this. It's not safe. He just showed you the money and ran away with it. Yeah, the cashier is like, cash, money? What do you do with it? It's just paper? What are we going to do, huh? Do you have two yuans? Two yuans, yeah, I do. Yeah, sweet. Dude, check this out. Can I show this? He brought me paper money in a plastic bag. I know, right? He didn't have any. He simply didn't have any cash. Because he was like, what, you brought me cash? You're weird, man. I don't know. Are you from some long-lost mountain tribe? Where did you get it? You couldn't have brought me a camel to trade for coffee while you're at it? You know? And he was like, what? We came here on horses. Yeah, like, what, can't you scan a QR code like a normal person? And where are you from? Are you a caveman and beast hide? In China, nobody pays with cash anymore, nor with credit cards, only with QR codes via two apps, Alipay and WeChat Pay. Even the homeless beg for a QR transfer. See, look, that one has a QR code on his chest. Well, they accept fiat money too, of course. Can you imagine? Street beggars have WeChat. E-commerce here has evolved to a point that people buy even coffee only via an app. Many coffee shops simply don't have a cash register. When you come to a restaurant in China, you don't wait for a waiter. You order your food remotely. There are tons of delivery boys scuttling across Chinese cities, all of them on electric scooters. Guys, we're in Shenzhen, a city that didn't even exist 40 years ago. And now this is one of the biggest megacities in the country, which is known as China's high-tech capital and the Chinese Silicon Valley. Shenzhen is an unbelievably green city. Check it out. The trees here are absolutely huge. I mean, you couldn't even tell that I am, in fact, in the city center, standing among these colossal skyscrapers. There are concrete high-rise buildings just like these all around here. But because of the sheer number of these huge trees and squares and some of these small parks, in alleys like this one, you don't feel trapped in a concrete box at all. Listen to this. Can you hear that silence? It's the city center. There is absolute silence here, and that is because of the sheer number of e-vehicles operating on the road. They make absolutely no noise. I mean, check it out. A car is approaching, but it makes no sound because it's electric, you know? You see that green plate? And there's another one, too. A green license plate. And there's another e-vehicle marked with a green license plate. Electric vehicles do not make any extra noise. And that's why, in the city center, it feels like you're in a park somewhere. 
Shenzhen has registered 740,000 electric vehicles. Now, for comparison, New York, a city of comparable size, has around 160,000. All taxis in big cities in China are electric only. Of course, it's a long way to go to Norway's level, where more than 80% of transport is battery powered. However, Norway's population is about four times smaller than Shenzhen's population alone. Guys, check this out, an electric sprinkler truck. It's an electric truck that irrigates. Cement trucks are electric. Sanitizers are electric. Ambulances are electric. What else is there? Fire trucks and all the rest of it. Everything is already electric. These garbage trucks, the ones that come empty your garbage dumpsters, they're electric too. There are average-sized electric trucks that move some materials around the city, like bricks and stuff. Uh-huh. Trash collectors. Also electric. That's the sanitizer, I bet. It's also electric. Sergei has lived in China for many years, but for the last two, he's been dealing with electric cars and has a popular YouTube channel all about them. My last car here was a BMW until two or three years ago, I guess, when this revolution happened. And I started testing it. I just couldn't believe my eyes. He's taking me to his favorite pastime, humiliating classic auto brands. All right, let's go test some rides. All right, let's go. This is a Q8. Why is this part just feel it? It's just rubber. Yeah, it feels like plastic or something. Well, it's the same as in a Volkswagen Golf, the spinning image, and I don't get why. To compare, here's Sergei's Chinese car that is one and a half times cheaper. And right here, touch it here, and now remember how it felt there. Yeah, it's so soft here, guys. You just want to keep stroking it. It's so smooth, like it's velvety soft. No, it's just, it's such a fucking ripoff. How drunk do you have to be to buy this car? To buy 350 horsepower for $100,000 with this rubber plastic. With this rubber plastic here. The interior isn't made of Napa. Napa is only for Maybachs. Here is the most trivial leather. The look and feel of it is also different, just leather worn a bit. Not smooth like in a Maybach or in a Lissang. And this Tamagotchi here. We'll wait for the keys and show you why it's a Tamagotchi screen for 100 grand. Here is how it's done in a Chinese car. The display is huge. It's like a real cinema at your fingertips. And the cool part is, it's a cinema for the passenger too. Here, as far as I understand, I can watch some movies. Oh, it's so responsive. I can select movies here, right? But Sergei's biggest passion is humiliating the most expensive cars. Guys, this is a Maybach. Do you feel the Napa here? That's Napa for you right there. Yeah, the leather here is so soft. In a Q8, yeah. here is the same as an yeah. Elysian, which costs four times less. And now check this out. Well, for starters, it's unclear why it's plastic here. All right, they can tell you it's royal varnish, that that's how it should be. Let's take a peek in here, though. Oh, guys, it is creaky as hell. Ah, check it out, how it comes off. How could they do this to it? Look at this here. Oh my, even a Geely doesn't have that. Guys, I'm gonna bring the mic closer here. This is unreal. It's creaking all over. I mean, like, when you initially drive a Maybach, you don't notice this at all. But when you start using Chinese rides, you feel the difference. You can hear that the Maybach creaks and squeaks. It's just like a child's rattle. Listen to that. Like it's cemented. Not a single squeak. Not a single one. The interior decoration materials are the same, but the assembly here is a disgrace for real. So this means that the assembling quality and so the in China is higher than like in Germany. It absolutely can be. I mean, that simply can't be the case. Yeah, I guess. Ah, it's squeaking too. 
This thing here is kind of... It's like a wobbly. Oh, check it out. The monitor's simply bending. Everything is squeaking here. This part here is on another level of squeaking. Some weird fans of the brand out there will write in the comments, it's squeaking here because it should be squeaking here, so that in case of an accident for safety reasons, it would easily like wrinkle up like an accordion and you wouldn't get hurt. So why don't Rolls Royces squeak? Check it out. A Mercedes E SUV, no finishers. I have them, they're here too. And this car is more expensive. While the small Zeker X, did you see that? The door opens and closes on its own, like in a Rolls Royce. $70,000. So, cards on the table here. German cars have better sound insulation than Chinese ones. They do. Yeah, close the door. Close that door. And there, bam, you're in a vacuum, in a capsule, it's... That's open, here, and here too. If you seal the hatch, it'll feel like you're in a capsule. I totally lost where I am, check how it's lagging. Yeah, you can clearly see there's a slow response, half a second or something after you drag your finger over it. And again, why is that? They don't make that on their own. They have to buy it from the Koreans or from the Chinese, and they buy it. They simply sell them this cheap stuff here. They just sell these dinosaur rides. And they know that there is no competition there. That certainly caught my attention, and I found a wealthy Audi owner in China. His Russian name is Alexei. Why is it gasoline-powered? Because I like it that way. There. Check it out. Yeah, there. That sound right there. Yes, exactly. Men need cars like these. Whereas electric vehicles, they go calmly. You know, you need to take it easy on them. But e-vehicles are smarter though. They accelerate faster than your ride. But there is another important thing. If you want to go on a long trip, for sure you'll have a hard time looking for a, a charging station. However, Alexei's key reason for buying a German car was that, in China, they're believed to be classy. Now, I guess this word would resonate with anyone who lived in the USSR, although we imbue it with a slightly different meaning than other nations. In China, classy goods are considered only as ones made abroad. Why did I buy a classy ride? Well, firstly, a classy ride stands for quality, right? The good stuff. And secondly, Everybody likes a BMW, a Mercedes, an Audi, and that's why I bought this one. You mean a foreign brand of car, right? A Chinese car isn't a classy one. Right. Well, do you yeah, realize yeah, yeah. that you could buy a Lycian for the same money? You could buy a Lycian 7, for instance. If I have to choose between a Lycian and an Audi, I'll choose the Audi 100%. So Chinese cars catch on fire, right? Teslas do the same. All e-vehicles sometimes set on fire. It's their thing. Well, now tell me, I mean, how do they light up? Are they... They say you can't extinguish the fire. Once it's on fire, it's game over. So you're, like, driving and then, bam, it just catches fire. No, 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 no. You have some time to exit the car, you can feel the smell. Do you mean, does the car explode? Well, yeah, like, is it dangerous for the driver? Well, of course it's dangerous, but I've never... I've seen cars flare up on TikTok, but I've never seen any people burning inside a car. Uh-huh. You'll have time to stop the car, get out of it, and have a look. But you have to remember one thing. Gasoline burns too. I saw this video once where a man in an X6, he stopped near a manure truck and they fought the fire with cow dung. 
And someone in the background said, hey, I don't know which is better here. To let it burn away or have your X6 showered in shit? Like, why did an X6 light up all of a sudden? I mean, it's a BMW we're talking about. A lot of them burn, actually. For real, go to YouTube, type in an ICE car burning, and there's reams of videos. How could they allocate the money to make such a good interior design with the budgets they have? Because they've got their screen cheaper. Because they've got the battery cheaper. Because they've got the engine cheaper too. Everything is made here. Uh, well, Chinese cars do break down, don't they? I mean, as they say, something Chinese means something unreliable. Let's discuss this point. It's a very interesting topic, by the way. A lot of people will be simply shocked, as it was a shock for me too. When I came here, just like everybody else, just like you, I guess, right? Just like everybody else. I knew, I remembered that Chinese equals unreliable. And like everybody else, I came here as a beggar. I didn't have a thing here. And like everybody else, I was pursuing my own goals. And of course, I bought myself a razor, just so that you know, it's still working. A Chinese one? Yeah, yeah. And whatever you buy in ordinary supermarkets, everything is as reliable as that razor. Many goods have quality levels. Let's take, for instance, cooling fans. They all look the same. The factory produces three quality levels all at once. The first quality level is for the home market, going to local stores. That's the same as Japanese, German, and other such country standards. Truth be told, it's quite easy to make a reliable fan. Just use some stronger materials, and that's it. The second level of quality is for products exported to medium-tier countries, and the third level of quality is for Africa, where the locals simply cannot afford anything better. That's basically how it works here. I learned about it when I dabbled in sales a bit myself. I started my own business of sorts. I dove into the system, I networked with our resellers who came here to stock up on supplies. And they told me that when you come to a factory, you should tell them the following. Don't give me what you were selling here. We need the very cheapest shit you've got to fool our customers and sell it to them for... We buy everything from you for nothing. And then resell it at home for three to four times higher the price. So that's how it goes. That's how our resellers taught me to do it here. Thank God I didn't stew in that pot for too long. On my first try, nothing came out of it, really. So I, I screwed up. I'm not gonna delve into it, it just didn't work out for me. I heard they checking for me, no one checking on me, so I had to go run up a check. I got the message on me, get no flexing on me, my attorney gonna call it collect. I had to put all their egos in check. In China, owning a gasoline car is much less economical than owning an electric one. But it's not only about the money. Let's talk about that point first. In China, gas-powered and electric vehicles cost roughly the same. However, e-vehicles are much cheaper to charge and service. Furthermore, almost all e-car manufacturers provide a lifetime warranty. The engine, electronics, gearbox, and the battery, all with a lifetime warranty. The battery has a lifetime warranty? Yes, so all the essential components but only for the first owner. That's the secret. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. They know that you will not be driving the same car for the rest of your life. You'll sell it at some point, and the warranty will be void. That's the catch. Anyway, it's nice, you know? You buy a new car, you don't have to worry about a thing here in China. While abroad, you never know. But wait, there's more. To drive a gas-powered car, you need to have special license plates, the blue ones that are for gas cars. And to get these plates, you have to buy them. The difference in cost can be thousands depending on the city, and you have to wait to get them. For instance, how much would a blue license plate cost in Guangzhou? When buying a blue license plate in Guangzhou, you will pay, no, you will have paid already for five years of insurance concurrently. Uh-huh. And then you may have a chance 
of getting a Guangzhou plate, but there isn't a 100% guarantee. So you can pay for the insurance, but they might not give you the plate? Yeah, yeah. How long do you have to wait for the plate? So in China, we call it Pai Mai. It's a special company which you pay let's say 10,000 or 20,000 to, and basically you buy it. Oh, okay, so you buy a place in the queue not to wait in line, right? That's it. So you're like paying someone to stand in line on your behalf then? So this one time, I was selling my Guangzhou license plate. Uh huh. I had two or three competing buyers. I could choose and sell it to the highest bidder. What's more, in some big cities, you can drive with a blue license plate only on even or odd days, depending on the last number of your license plate. Now, sometimes gasoline cars from other cities are not allowed to drive through certain streets. It's crazy, whereas there are no such restrictions for the electric green license plates. But the most amazing thing, guys, is that although electric cars here are cheaper and more economical and more convenient to drive and they have no restrictions and so on, there are still people who prefer gasoline-powered cars. They don't care whether it's more expensive, the wait's longer, they will wait for a month or two to get their driving license and, nevertheless, they want a gasoline car. I think it speaks volumes about us as humans. But no way, no matter how hard it is, no matter how much I struggle, I will continue to live my life the way my grandparents did. The motorways are packed with unthinkable numbers of CCTV cameras that record violations and issue fines. Now, there are many other cities with traffic control CCTVs, but here they pop up every 10 to 15 meters. Local cameras give you a wink when they find you. There is a light that flares up and basically you know that you were caught on tape. Those cameras issue fines for everything for the slightest violation. But not only for exceeding the speed limit or driving in the wrong lane, but also for holding your phone when you're driving or for not fastening your seatbelt or for not having a child seat. These cameras can detect everything. They see everything. And then they send you these happy letters with your fines. And of course, numerous cameras focus on face recognition. China is not just a global leader in outdoor CCTV surveillance, but also the first country to incorporate all cameras into a single automated tracking system. It will recognize you anywhere, even in the most unusual locations. Some fun facts about the Chinese facial recognition system. Check it out. I am at an airport, and this is the flight timetable. Now I come closer to it, and it recognizes my face. And look, it gives me my data, my gate, and how to get to it, my flight number. It knows everything about me. Now, mind you, I haven't officially shared my biometric data anywhere here, and I'm not entirely sure how they got it in the first place. Now, they must have taken a video of me at the check-in desk, or when I arrived in China for the first time, and then it's just been sitting in some shared database ever since then. They scan for your biometric data all the time. For instance, when you enter the subway. That means the police know not only how many people are currently underground, but who exactly is on the train at any given moment. The subway security is very tough. They can frisk you at the subway entrance. And police officers are armed with helmets, shields, and special feelers to restrain the mob and pluck out the most active protesters. Many stations have these blast containers to defuse bombs. However, Chinese police officers, including those who do the frisking, are perfectly okay with being filmed. Because why not? There are 500 cameras here filming them from every angle. I mean, just look, there are cameras all over the place. There's one there, five or six there, one down there, and another. They're used to it. There's more than a billion CCTV cameras in the country, and given that there is a single messenger here, WeChat, with a single payment system linked to it, by combining all of this data, you can learn with incredible precision what, where, and when every single person was doing something what they talked about and with whom. On the upside, residents don't need to worry as no one will break into their homes. Street crime is almost zero. 
But that's not all. Public transport and taxi drivers in big cities are being monitored via face recognition software to prevent fatigue. And if they fall asleep, they send them home. So public transportation is safer. There's a sea of examples like this. Now, if you think about this rationally, it seems that there is nothing bad about the fact that the airport knows what you look like. At the end of the day, we share our photos and geolocations on our own all the time, and we post a lot of stuff on social media, so you can learn a lot of things about us anyway. Ultimately, the goal is to enhance public safety and drive comfort and convenience, and it really is comfortable and convenient. Or at least that's what I think. Despite all the fines and cameras, the Chinese break the rules anyway. There are some rules that everybody knows can be broken. For example, this sign here, stopping or parking is strictly prohibited. The yellow line also means that you can't park here. But check it out, all the spaces are filled. Every single one, nobody cares. There are a lot of myths about the Chinese surveillance and fine system, largely created by international media giants. For instance, the global media has been scaring us with the Chinese social rating system for nearly 10 years now. Wherever Ouyang Pa goes, she's being closely watched. What she buys, how she behaves, is tracked and scored to measure how responsible and trustworthy she is as an individual. The problem is that within China, nobody has ever heard about such a system. It's pure fiction. Social rating systems with likes for good deeds and dislikes for bad deeds do not exist in China. I told my wife about it. My wife is Chinese. I said, they've been talking about a social rating system in China on the news. I translated it, explained what it was about. She laughed out loud. She nearly fell off her chair. And then she said something that cracked me up. She said, if there was such a rating, our daughter's score would be minus 200. And I'm like, yeah, sure. So if you help an old lady cross the street, nobody's going to give you points? No. Throw in no. a like to your rating? No. And then you pee on a tree, minus no. a like, a dislike? No. Maxim has lived in China for more than 15 years. All right, is it true that if they identify you with their facial recognition system while you're crossing the road, no. if you litter no. in the street, bam, you get a fine? No. no. Those who have never been to China believe all sorts of nonsense, but those who have understand that it's all rubbish, in fact. They say China has no theft. Due to all the cameras and control here, people have been dissuaded, in a word, from trying to steal and have actually stopped doing it. They say that you can leave, I don't know, like your bag on a motorcycle and come back later and it will still be there. Basically, I decided to check it out and run an experiment. So I'm taking this Louis Vuitton bag and I'm leaving it on the most beautiful and bustling embankment in Shanghai. And just look at all this beauty, and then I'll wait and see if anyone takes it or not. Truth be told, I'm a bit nervous. That bag is pricey. Like any other area, this embankment has CCTV surveillance, so I took that into account. Now, to make it clear, I left the bag in a blind spot. All of those cameras are looking the other way. There it is, the bag. What's more, these bushes provide decent cover from all sides, so in theory, nothing should scare off a potential thief. As soon as I walked away into the crowd, a woman in red seemed to have noticed the bag and moved from a faraway spot directly towards it. She sat down next to it and pretended to be reading something, but I was certain that she was going to swipe it and leave. I walked farther away, but I mean, I'm worried sick. There it is, it's just sitting there. But eventually, some man came up to the woman and I realized that she was waiting for her husband and not for a moment to steal the bag. Look closely, passers-by aren't even looking in the direction of an item that cost $3,000 left unattended on a bench. There, at last, it has caught someone's attention. And a couple minutes later, a dude with a bag across his shoulder comes right up to it and inspects it. Right, that guy is definitely interested in my bag. He's looking around as if he's looking out for the cameras. He comes back soon and loiters around the bag, studying the CCTV posts. I'm almost dead sure that he's gonna take it, but he doesn't. I'm a little hurt. Girls won't look at a Louis Vuitton bag. I mean, girls won't look at a Louis Vuitton bag. They could have at least given it a glance, eyed it up a bit. It's sitting right there, it's nobody's property. 3,000 bucks for a bag, and no one notices. 
Just so you get an idea of how far I am from the bag, let's count. One, two, three, four. 48, 49, 50. And there you have it, guys. I am 50 steps away from it, which means I won't have time to run for it. And now this is getting interesting. Here comes the embankment cleaning manager, a cleaner. So let's see how he reacts to the bag. But the cleaner passes by as if the bag isn't there at all. You see, guys, even the cleaner doesn't give a damn. He looked and was like, well, that's a bag. It's just a bag. There are lots of bags out there. It's incredible, guys. Incredible. I mean, it looks like this bag is not getting stolen here today. Nobody wants a $3,000 bag here in China. Hello. Hello. This is a fancy guy in a Beijing bikini. In China, Beijing bikinis are rolled up men's t-shirts and you'll see them everywhere. By the way, since 2020, Beijing bikinis have been prohibited in Beijing itself. All right, guys, that's it. I'm taking my bag back. I've been here almost an hour. Thousands of people have passed by. There were police officers, cleaners, women, children. Nobody wants to steal a $3,000 bag in China. By the way, this bag didn't really cost me $3,000. I bought it for about $100. This is a really high quality fake bag. This is no ordinary counterfeit, but a class triple A counterfeit, which means you can't tell the difference between this one and an original piece. It has nothing in common with the low quality fakes you usually see on the market. And actually, you can't buy a bag like this on the market. We are in the Sanyun Li district. In the 1980s and early 1990s, it was pretty rough here. There were a lot of gangsters, lots of friction. I'm going to show you places where people used to sell drugs, and there were junkies everywhere. Bandits were constantly shanking each other and all that shit. Me and Will, that's his English name, are walking around the northern part of Guangzhou city center. Will had some hefty issues with the law back in the day. I can't dish out any details, but he claims that since he's got out, he's been clean. I grew up in those apartment blocks. He spent his childhood in this district. That's your door there, right? Right. They changed the house numbers. I lived in this first building. Sanyang Li is a village. A city village, is that what you call the slums? Well, yeah, a sort of slums, something like that. A big gang from Xinjiang used to rule over here. Wow. They would simply rob everybody. Yeah, it was absolutely mental here. Back in the day, folks from other parts of the city just wouldn't come here. It was too dangerous. Because... Basically, in Guangzhou, everyone speaks Cantonese or Mandarin, but the guys from Xinjiang speak neither. They just didn't speak at all. They simply didn't understand others. They would come up to people, shank them, and take their shit. Relations between the Uyghurs, the Xinjiang province residents, and the rest of China have been very complicated for many years. Global media most often cover only one side of the tensions, how the Chinese government violates the Uyghurs' rights. The majority of Uyghurs practice Islam and therefore have their own very different culture. Inside China, on the other hand, they most often discuss Xinjiang immigrants' attacks on locals with cold weapons. The biggest attack occurred in 2014 at the Kunming City Railway Station when 31 people were slaughtered. It's no wonder that these tensions gave rise to gangster fights in Guangzhou where, historically, people from different regions gravitated in search of work. In the mid-90s, Government authorities decided to cleanse this zone. They sent the army here, there were boots on the ground, to get rid of the Xinjiang gangs. 
and basically all gangs as a whole. Since then, things are looking up around here. But before that, it was hell. Even in the 2000s. I'll show you the spots. People would just sell drugs in the streets. The Xinjiang gangs would sell heroin here. And everything else, from hash to heroin, junkies used to come here, they'd buy that shit, and they get a fix right there on the spot. For many decades, Guangzhou, the biggest port city in China, has been a drug trade hub. This has been the case since the first opium war that took place in 1839, when the English tried to make the Chinese empire purchase their narcotics. They stormed Guangzhou, seized control over neighboring Hong Kong, and started selling the most profitable product of the British Empire at that time, opium. That was the beginning of what they call the century of humiliation in China, which still echoes through the ages today. Do you see these tracks? Yes. So the thing is, there used to, there used to be a descent down to those tracks. Junkies used to buy their shit here and go down there to shoot up. There were needles everywhere. It was pretty bad. It's pretty bad. It was pretty bad. This district was vividly depicted in a documentary by Chinese journalist Zhu Hao, whose title can be translated as Hooked. Beyond the railway tracks, we came across a drug addict who had been severely beaten by the police. Today, it's hard to believe this Guangzhou district once looked like it did in that documentary only 15 years ago. Starting from the 2000s, I came here a lot back in the day. Many fugitives began to pop up here. They used to come over from different regions. You could meet some really strange people here from time to time. You could instantly tell just by the looks of them that they were not from around here. They'd hang around for some time and then they'd just disappear. So you could live here and none of the authorities would know that you were hiding here? Yeah, yeah. Once there was this fugitive hiding from the police, he burst into our building, not my house, I lived on the fifth floor, and he burst onto the first floor because he was running from the police and the police were chasing him. So the police were in pursuit of this guy, he rushed to the first floor and took a little girl as his hostage. We knew that girl, you see? She was our neighbor. And he'd taken her as a hostage. He was armed to the fucking teeth. Then the police came. I was a little boy, nine years old. So I looked out, saw that our house was surrounded by police troops and SWAT teams. They got up machine guns. So they were all around on all sides. They had the building surrounded, yeah. It was crazy. A negotiator came out. He said something to this dude. They were talking for four hours. And then the dude surrendered. I saw it all. And that's the kind of shit I grew up in. There used to be only three things happening here. Robbery, drug dealing, and prostitutes. There used, to be a, a there used to be a lot of girls around here. <laughs> it's hard to believe now, but this used to be a junkie's paradise here. There's a Mercedes. All the expensive cars are here. Now business is booming here. Check it out. There are so many cool rides here. This district is still the trade hub for illegal items. The difference is that the dealers have been focusing on something more lucrative and most importantly, safer than drugs, counterfeits. Since the late 90s or 2000s, this place has become well known for its fake stuff. Any fake item, fake watches, fake clothing, fake shoes, you name it. And people come here to buy all sorts. This building here is renowned for its fake sneakers. 
because it even got a mention in a UN report. They track copyright infringements, and they mention this place in particular in one of their reports. They sell tons of counterfeit Jordans, Nike, Adidas, and stuff like that. We used to come stock up here. It was really cheap. This whole street, this entire street here sells clothes and bags. Those who sell clothes come to stock up here. People from all over the world come here to buy clothes and resell them. You see, they sell watches here. Yeah. From here on, it's all watches. Yeah. Yeah. Fake Rolexes. So there's footwear. Then clothing, then watches. And then the watches, yeah. This means this street is divided into segments. Hello, sir. That guy wanted us to buy some fake watches. Guys, today we're looking for some gifts for our dear ladies. So let's grab ourselves a stylish bag. Filming in this shopping center is strictly prohibited. Special police officers ensure that people comply with this rule. They have all that gear nearby, just in case. One of them noticed my camera, and I quickly had to put it away. Check it out, there are so many shops here. These are copies of the best known global brands. Bags, accessories, glasses, footwear, Anything you like. All the bags, all the goods, they don't have any signs or marks, no logos. They either rub them out or take them off as selling things with logos is prohibited here. Uh huh. And then when you buy it, you can put the logo back on. No, they just bring whatever it is you need from the back store. Uh huh. The most important thing is that there are counterfeits of different quality levels here. An ordinary tourist would most likely buy a poor quality and pricey fake. However, they taught me how to get a good quality fake. Let me show you how. Guys, I go to the Louis Vuitton official website. How do you spell Louis Vuitton, huh? I, I, I don't even know how to spell Louis Vuitton. Now, we're going to show them the bags on it and try to buy the exact same ones. I like this one for $26,000. I simply adore $26,000 bags. I'm kidding, I don't. Actually, it's in yuan, not US dollars. It's $3,000, which is no steal either. I think that's the one. Yeah. Turn off the camera. I can't film it. Okay. We changed the camera, although just to be clear, this is not a hidden camera which would be banned in China. My camera is clearly visible on my chest. It's just that not everybody notices it. Artyom shows the bag we want on his phone. Yes, yes, yes. She calls her assistants to find a bag just like this one. In the meantime, I'm looking at what is on display. Now pay attention, there are indeed no logos anywhere. The seaming is well done, I mean really good. Soon the bag appears. She says they have it. We'll check the quality now. Can we see it? Can we see? Okay, okay. Bring it here. The bag must have a Louis Vuitton logo on it, like this one. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if it'll have one. It will. That's why they bring it from the back. Yes, yes, yes. Louis Vuitton. Yes, Louis Vuitton. There, check it out here. The logo's faded. Oh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've done that on purpose. Right. While I wait, I examine the original to compare them later. I want it to be the spitting image of the original. A few minutes later, they bring us the bag. The saleswoman says she wants 700 yuan for it, around $100. Can we have a look? Can we see? Counterfeits like these are distributed all over the world from this spot. Now, an inexperienced person wouldn't tell that it's a fake, but I know where to look. No, here the quality can clearly be noticed. You see, it's all a bit shrunken, and here it's all uneven, and the color itself is a bit of a mess. The color is different. Yeah, yeah. We're gonna say we won't buy this one and ask them to bring us a better quality item. So they told us to wait for half an hour, and they'll fetch the bag from a faraway warehouse. 
Half an hour later, we come back here. The saleswoman unpacks another bag for us and we instantly see that this is a much higher level of counterfeiting. Oh yeah, check this out. It's all made much neater here. The red color, could you give me that one to compare? That one is no good, this one is better. Yeah, yeah, there's a stark difference in color. Here it's pink and here it's for real. Uh-huh, yeah, this here. This one is cheaper. Yeah, this one is really cheap. You can feel that this is a trinket, but this is good. It has a really good turn lock right there. It's on a whole other quality level, top shelf quality, I would say. Now, did you catch that while I was looking around, the saleswoman knocked the dodgy fake down to 580 yuan? She realized that we know our stuff. However, our goal here is only a high quality bag. And check it out, how the seams are made. Here, they're all crooked and bulging out, yeah. Now look at these seams here, and look what yeah, neat yeah. seams this one has. Now check it out, step by step. Here's some weird, thick plastic crap. And here it's small, elegant, metallic. And give me that, I, I want to compare the seams with the photo. No, with the photo. The seams go like that, and sometimes they mess up the seams. The seam pattern is it's sometimes wrong. But these seams are perfectly imitated. So now for the main part, the haggle. How much? What's the price? Now she wants 1,150, twice as much as the bad counterfeit. No, no, no. All right, here is the final price, 1,100, not a cent less. No, 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 this is the final price. No, 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 this is premium quality. I foolishly wrote 800, although I wanted to drive it down to 500. She collects the goods and pretends that she's not interested. I pretend I yield and offer her 850. Okay, like that. No, 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 the very last price. She shows me 1100 again. In China, they haggle hard. You can take the cheaper bag for your price. But I know these games all too well. We just get up and pretend that we're leaving. Okay, the very last, last price. She's dropped it down to 1000 Okay, good quality. No, 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 850, 850. 850. All right, we'll think it over. Let's go. We'll think about Give it. Give me the price. 850, it's my final offer. All right, this is my final offer, okay? It's 900 now, and that self-confidence she was brimming with a minute ago has vanished. No, 850. 850 is expensive. Artyom knows the prices far better than I do, and naturally, I made a mistake by showing 800 at the beginning. I should have lowered it even more. They're on board, you see? You should push them harder. Harder than that? So they wanted... Well, give me five minutes. Five minutes, I'm telling you. Well, let's think about it. We started with 1,200. We cut it to 850. Artyom continues to haggle with the saleswoman via a translation app on his phone. The police will check the card? What do you mean the police will check the card? I cannot put it here. What does he mean he can't put it here? She can't keep it on display because of inspections. Oh, I see, I see. Finally, the woman gives us the bag, although we haven't paid for it yet, so that while we're thinking, it stays in our hands. You get it, right? It's like, we can't leave this bag here while we think it over? But yes, the police might check here. He says the police may check them, yes. She's just showing me that there are epaulets up there. Did you see that? Ah, there are epaulets up there. Yeah. Well, she's pressing my buttons here. But I mean, everybody knows what epaulets are. Everyone's tense. Can you feel the atmosphere? Yeah, everyone's really fidgety. The air seems to have thickened up, for real. It turns out that there is a raid going on in the building. You can't say that the locals aren't ready for them, but there is tension every time anyways. We don't want to be caught with a fake in our hands, so we go back. I decide to play the strongest of hands in the game of haggling. We saw it cheaper at another shop, so we're gonna go ask them. You could tell by their expressions that the sellers were not pleased and realized that they would have to go lower, even lower than their last lowest offer. They don't like it when the customer starts playing them. At another shop, they had it for 700, so we're gonna go there. We're gonna have a look and then come back, okay? Okay. She says we can take it for 700. Aren't we gonna check it? We should check it. All right, guys, 700. We'll take it for 700. 
So there you have it. We got ourselves a Louis Vuitton. Not a genuine, of course, but in a genuine looking cover. With the right Louis Vuitton-esque color, all of these fittings, belts, they're perfect quality. It has perfect seams. The seam work is exactly the same as a genuine Louis Vuitton would have. We'll take it to the store where they sell genuine Louis Vuittons and compare it. I take this fake bag and go to the most elite shopping mall in the neighboring Shenzhen city. You see, it's all posh and fancy looking here. As soon as I walk in, the security guy summons an individual consultant for me. Poor guy, he doesn't know what's in store for him yet. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, sir. Do you have this bag here just like this one? Yes, we do. Do you need the same bag? Yes, the same bag. A large size? Yes, yes, of course. Would you follow me, please? Uh huh, okay. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Would you like a drink? No, no, thank you. They assigned two sales managers to me. It's no wonder when I came here to buy one of the most expensive bags in the store. And the way they see it, it's my second one. The woman is telling her colleague to hurry up. Cards on the table, I feel nervous, as if I'm robbing a bank. Finally, they bring me an original. Here you are? Yes. The same size? Yes. The man goes for the price tag, and I start comparing. They look the same, don't they? Yes. So at first glance, even a professional wasn't able to tell the difference. What if we look closer? There must be something different. Yes, absolutely identical seams. You know, I bought this one in Guangzhou. In Guangzhou? Yes, this one's from Guangzhou. I just wanted to compare if it's genuine or not. And they look identical. Where did you buy it? In Guangzhou, at a store. Yeah, I mean, look, they're, they're totally the same. Do you have the receipt? No, 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 I, I don't have a receipt. I bought it at a marketplace. I just wanted to compare them. Yeah, look, it's the same as here. It's exactly the same seam. Absolutely. How much did you pay for it? This one, $100. What does this one cost? $100. What does this one cost? $24,500. $24,500 yuan, right? Right. Yeah. Uh-huh. The color on the inside is completely the same. Absolutely everything is the same. I'm trying to compare the seams. This is the genuine one. Check it out, guys. It's all wrinkled. It looks like the woman has gone to call security, so I need to hurry up with my inspection before they kick me out. Check it out, it's even a bit crooked. And this one is straight. This means the fake one shows a much better quality. By the looks of it, they have no distinguishing traits at all. Not a single difference. Neither from this side nor from that one. Now look, even the handles are exactly the same color. <laughs> the seams are all the same, guys. This one has folds, the original one has folds. And here, look, the original one is slightly crooked. And here, look, they made it neater in the fake one. Yeah, I just wanted to compare, you know. This one costs 700. 700? 700 yuan. And this one costs 24,000. So you didn't buy it in a boutique? No, it's not genuine, it's a counterfeit. But they're identical. The color and all the fittings, they're all the same. They look similar. But the price isn't. No, the, the price isn't the same. That's the only difference. Quality-wise, there's no way to determine whether it's genuine or not, only by price. It's amazing, but that's the hard truth. And even the professionals can't tell the original and the fake apart. Check it out. There's a little seam on this strap, and they repeated the exact same tiny seam on this strap. It's literally pound for pound an identical copy. Guys, I did not expect these bags to be so similar. I mean, seriously, they're nigh on the same. It looks like even the shop assistants are puzzled by this uncanny similarity, as if for the first time in their lives they realize that they were selling something 40 times more expensive than it really cost. They're 100% identical. Yes. yes. Guys, that one is for 24,500, and those girls are taking it back. 
I bought this one for 700. I'll tell you how you can get it a bit later. Thank you. Thank you. Vibe blowing at the jack, got the loud jumping at the back. Everything I'm on slack. Everything I do is. Where to now? Where are we going, Sergey? We are going to explore a factory that manufactures scented jars. Our goal is not to look at the product itself, but rather to look at how it's made. But we are not going to tell the factory owners about it. We will introduce ourselves as customers, and I have a tried and tested methodology that will operate. The girls will be our distraction. Yes, they will distract people, keep them busy. With our beauty. While I'll be checking out. Stop them in their tracks. How it's made. And this way, we skim through everything. All the technicalities, all the equipment, everything we need. You mean we're stealing from the Chinese? Well, we're not stealing, in fact. We are upping their game. But isn't that what the Chinese do? Why can't we do to them what they do to us? Sergei owns a fast-growing high-tech company in China. He plans to launch a new production line for flavor additives. We're going to pay a visit to his future competitors to take a peek at their technology with an aim to replicate it. I asked him to show me how it's done. This is the most interesting stuff. Hence, no special invitation, right? Right, listen up. We pass by all the conference rooms, and what's the first place we head for? The factory floor. Why is it important to keep it quiet? Because if a manager catches us, he'll be bothering us for hours, spinning his yarn. Giving us tea. Giving us tea, yeah. And that way, you'll lose a lot of time. Who wants to do that? Before the owners catch up to us, we'll be going to their production lines. Sergei needs to know what equipment exactly he should procure for his new plant. We use the elevator without permission. Won't this come off as like a break-in? Like, like a break-in, like illegal breaking and entering. We got noticed and a factory worker is trying to stop us. What are you doing here? You don't need me now, right? You're our good luck charm. Check it out, the Chinese lady's bewildered. She still can't understand what's going on. Let's go. There, never listen to anyone for too long, yeah? It's time to leg it. They're going to call the police. Yeah, right, why would they? So long as we keep smiling. Sergei's goal is to see as many production processes and equipment models as possible, because when you're launching a new production line, not all the details of the process are evident. If I plan to set up production, I need to know what components should be used. One of them's washing the cans. I've never seen a line like that. So now I know this line exists and should be taken into account. Guys, this is the first time I'm witnessing industrial espionage in the making. This is clearly not the most high-tech manufacturing setup, but the mechanics for copying any other production process are roughly the same. In just 20 minutes, we've literally managed to look at the entire technical line to go to places where you would normally never be allowed to go. I am adjusting the elephants that are right here in the room. Church is way more than the people who walk in the building. No wonder you see in my zone. And we only spent 20 minutes on it. We saw the whole line. Otherwise, if the manager... Because we just barged in and went right where we wanted yeah, to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's why it's crucial to understand your own goals. If you work in China, you must have a clear goal and always move towards it. When we were on our way out, we got caught, of course. The factory owners were particularly interested in what we had been filming. Why won't they let us film? They often make counterfeit products on the shop floor. And of course, they're very edgy about any cameras because they are afraid you might be recording a video about fake goods. They're taking us to the tea room to find out who we are. We have to think of a solid excuse for leaving, yeah? This room displays the factory's merchandise and I noticed some branded perfume there too. For instance, here is Boss, actually, this is the fragrance of the original Hugo Boss, but of course, this one here has nothing to do with the original. The managers don't know what to do with us. They can't call the police as it would draw too much attention to their factory, so they decide to simply let us go. 
All right, we're leaving. Heading to the next factory. Perhaps we won't need that line after all. Either way, it's great that we've seen it. The Chinese themselves are masters of industrial espionage. So why on earth do they let strangers in so easily? They don't. Remember, that was not easy. Nobody would even believe it was possible to do what we just did. They don't let you in easily. You have to know how to do it, and that's experience. I've been fine-tuning that method for years. We're going to another manufacturer, this time a larger one. So here, we won't get away with the liberties we allowed ourselves when snooping on the smaller companies. I feel like a raider, like Bonnie and Clyde. Yeah, there is a touch of that. This is the fun part. When I first came here as a young man, i just come to China to do some business here. I soon took to sneaking into places. I always snuck into premises, facilities, to see what they were doing. It was surprised every time, but overall, they were always friendly. And that's when I realized it was possible in theory. Was there ever a time when someone gave you a good kicking? No, no, never ever, no. You have to look pretty not to get kicked. You just have to smile a lot. The Chinese are not aggressive that way. They are very calm and level-headed. If a person is smiling at them, they automatically read them as positive and harmless. As soon as we get in, Sergei starts peering at everything. Everybody smiles without uttering a single word. But the managers appear really fast. Good afternoon. Um, which, company which company are you looking for? Trying not to waste too much time on them, Sergei and his team passes through the workshops. They quickly take photos of everything on the way. I think it's time to get out. Some big bosses will be heading down. Right, that's the warehouse? Let's try and escape in the lift. Oh, there's the stairs. All right, guys, the key thing now is to make off fast and neat. Listen, I think part of the success is coming in a car like this. Well, that also does the trick. But as we're leaving, they caught us anyway. We're done for, right? A woman is standing in front of the car and not letting us go. What are they saying? They are saying, who are you here to see? What are you doing here? Why are you in such a hurry? The woman in red is clearly in charge and she's pissed. Sergei is arguing outside. Long story short, we got out in the end. But not without getting into trouble, of course. Literally two to three minutes more and we'd have gotten away unnoticed. But that's okay. We pretty much saw everything. They let us go after all. So basically, we're good, right? Right. Sergei used to deal in supplying so-called refs from China, which are essentially phones assembled on a market. We'll do a separate in-depth overview of China's enormous market for fake phones, clothing, car parts, and much more, which will also feature Sergei's story. Now he's making his own brand of cosmetological and medical lasers in China. This is the latest model. These lasers cost $30,000. This one here is very powerful. I was curious to see the labor conditions at the high-tech factories in China, as there are many news bites online that the conditions in them are absolutely monstrous. For instance, Apple's manufacturer Foxconn is regularly accused of worker exploitation. They say factory workers are just short of dropping dead on the shop floor. Allegedly, some of them take their own lives. They work till they drop. Cruel managers humiliate workers, penalize them for no reason, and fail to pay promised wages. There was even a term coined in English journalism slang, Foxconn suicides, which denotes any and all suicides committed at Chinese electronic factories. Yet it later came to light that the percentage of suicides among Foxconn workers is actually lower than in the U.S. So in a sense, being a U.S. citizen is more dangerous than being a Chinese factory worker. Chinese factories equal harsh labor conditions and exploitation and all that stuff. That's what's been covered extensively by the media. People live in barracks and are not allowed to come home for the night. 
Yeah, mainly in companies. It's not just a myth. There are many companies out there which have truly miserable working conditions for the Chinese. Now, as a businessman, the first thing I realized was I can create something different in China. First and foremost, better labor conditions. How much does a rank-and-file assembly worker get, for instance? The minimum wage I guarantee all my workers is $1,000. How long have you been here? You've worked here 15 years, right? I've lived and worked here for 15 years. Over that period, the wages must have gone up big time, right? I guess so, yes. They've gone up twice. Explain this then. So you sell the bulk of your product, your lasers, outside of China. That's right, yeah. Also, the workforce in China is already pretty expensive. At least you can't say it's cheap. It's not yeah. dirt cheap. Yeah. So why do you produce it all in China if you don't sell it here and if the workforce is pricey? Now you mention it, that's a very interesting discussion. I observed companies back in 2014. It was like there was this state of crisis before the first war that broke out here. And you know, I observed the following. Russian companies that work in China relocated to Russia as the USD exchange rate had spiked. And all those companies, which I mentioned, well, they later closed down. They were lagging behind in quality and failed to upgrade in time. And in general, setting up production in China and in Russia are completely different things. Not a single Chinese man would skip work or not come to work because of a hangover or something. They work every day like machines 24-7. It's in their DNA. Our post-Soviet workers have something else in their DNA. They demand respect. They want everything to be handed to them. They want decent pay. Basically, they want to be capricious first and might work later. Well, the Chinese can also get wasted, but they don't come to work with a hangover? They get wasted a lot. I mean, the Chinese are heavy drinkers. It's a drinking nation, same as the Japanese. However, you see, it's different. They don't use that as an excuse not to show up at work. In more than 10 years of manufacturing and business experience in China, I haven't had a single case of a Chinese worker staying at home under some pretext. Never, ever. So China's competitive advantage is no longer its cheap workforce, but that everybody shows up to work. Yes, China's competitive advantage is that the commodity base is here. And within that commodity base, there is an extremely tough level of competition. For example, if you want to make, let's say, a metal casing, not a simple casing, but a casing with grooves chiseled in aluminum. So I'm in grooves that enable liquid to flow through them. It looks quite simple. So you think this thing here would cost, let's say, roughly 800 rubles, for instance, one item. But if you chisel it somewhere in Germany, that order will firstly be under a long-term contract, and secondly, the volume will be huge, and thirdly, the cost will be different. If I need to do that, I go outside, and there was like 20 such small companies that would do that. I can go about it relaxed and pushing for the price that I need. Here you can solve everything in a couple of days. Just a couple of days, that's all it takes. I can map it out as follows. Day one, I work with my 3D printing team to make a new design. Day two, I'll get a completed product. The upgrading rates, the modernization rates here are tremendously high, and they apply to everything. The Chinese infrastructure upgrades just as fast. In 2010 to 2012, it was a nightmare of a city. There were rats the size of a cat roaming the streets. There were black guys who'd sell anything you wanted on every street corner. All sorts of banned substances. Yeah, they used to say you could buy a container of weed in Guangzhou. Like, it was that easy. You just come here and buy it, no problems at all. Of course, now it's all... And that was just 10 years ago. Literally 10 years ago. Over the last 15 years, China has changed beyond all possibility. If you weren't witness to it, you would never believe it, because it was a truly impossible feat. For such a big country, the Chinese infrastructure has really reached incredible heights. And that not only concerns mega constructions, but also the smaller details. 
This is Guangzhou Railway Station. Now check it out, entire rows of massage chairs. I know they lost their shock factor a while ago, and they're still in lots of airports, but look at the sheer number here. And unlike most other places where they're installed, in China, they are genuinely used. Like check it out, how many people there are actually sitting in them and having their backs massaged. The railway station itself is vast and clean. You see children are running around and playing on their own. Nobody is afraid that something will happen to them. There's drinking water available everywhere, both cold and hot. This is a typical situation. A Chinese person went to the grocery store, bought some instant noodles, and poured some hot water in them at the railway station. Because why go to a restaurant when you can just sit wherever you want and eat it? And in fact, it's easy and it's fast. And you know, it's tasty too. Hot water is available at all airports. The Chinese high-speed train network, now that's a whole nother story. It's not just that they can go faster than 300 kilometers per hour, but rather it's the sheer number of them. High-speed trains commute between big cities every 15 to 20 minutes, but they even connect smaller towns. China has the world's longest high-speed train track network spanning over nearly 40,500 kilometers. So you get the big picture. Spain comes in second with high-speed tracks 11 times shorter. In Japan, they're 12 times shorter. In the US and Russia, there are no high-speed train tracks at all. And the trains that are called high-speed crawl at the speed of the average Chinese underground trains. Yes, China has high-speed subways inside its cities. Guys, this is the first high-speed subway I have ever traveled by. As the train picks up speed, my ears are popping for real. And check this out, they even have a warning here that this is a high-speed train. So like, please hold on to the rails, because when it accelerates, you can really feel it. This is the subway of Shenzhen, China's Silicon Valley, and it's still not the fastest. There are wireless phone chargers in the cars, which I think is overkill, and you can safely leave your phone to charge. In Shanghai, I did it all the time. I'd sit a long way from my charging device without a care in the world, and I won't even bother doing any stealing experiments because you already know the result. Different Chinese cities seem to be competing with each other and enhancing their subway. In Chengdu and Chongqing, for instance, the railway cars have, wait for it, split climate control systems. Check it out, guys. The railway stations have trains with these kind of setups. You see, these cars here are cooler, and cars 13 through 24 have warmer temperatures. So you see, guys, within one train, there are cars with different temperatures. Those who want a cooler climate go to one set of cars, and then those who want something warmer go to another set of cars. What are you Chinese even doing? What are you doing? Here, guys, check this out, how the Chinese pay attention to detail. The line that I'm on is red, and these handles here are also red. That barrier there is also red. The entire design is red. The same goes for the orange line and any other, the blue, the green, whatever. Many stations don't look like stations, but rather like some international airports with vast halls and waiting lounges. The main problem with having such a huge hall for a subway entrance is finding a spot to sell tickets from. It's totally unclear where that spot is here. You could spend half your day wandering around this place and still not find it. Look at the number of levels in this subway. There's the lower level, here's the middle one, and up above, there's yet another level. These are all railway platforms, you see? These are all intersecting lines. Hold on, I'm that way. Rush hour, Guangzhou subway, all hell's gonna break loose. Check it out, as soon as the doors open, people on the platform start lunging forward, not letting anybody get out of the rail car. In China, you don't normally off your seats to others. Instead, you just wedge in front of the guy in front of you. For instance, everyone's waiting for the train in line. Bam, this girl just steps forward and takes first place. Look at this, the people who are standing behind start bursting forward. 
That girl stood behind me, but now she's jumped ahead of me. <laughs> All right. It's getting pretty snug in here, guys. It's my first time on the Chinese subway in rush hour. Truth be told, in Moscow, I had it worse. There's not much air to breathe, but I'll live. I'll hold my breath till the next stop. In China, they can start wedging in front of you in a line for the cashier or for coffee or wherever. You just have to get used to it. Just as you have to get used to most foreign services being banned in the country, while local ones don't always work as expected. In China, it looks as if everything is intentionally made to complicate things for foreign tourists. For instance, all foreign map services are banned here, while the local ones are all in Mandarin only. And you can't search for it with the Roman alphabet. If you want to go somewhere, you have to punch in the characters. Do you know how to write Chinese characters in the app? I'm so fucking cute, bitch. They have pinyin, a letter-based version of the language. But why can't you use it in the app by default? Why can't you punch in letters in a map service by default? It's all in Mandarin. Not a single thing is translated. There's a lot of information there, which intersection to go to, which platform to choose, but you can't understand anything. One would think translating a mobile app into any language would be really easy in the 21st century. But in South Korea also, foreign map apps are banned, and you must use the local Kakao map. However, it also has versions in other foreign languages. So, in general, Chinese apps are hands down inferior to their foreign competitors, and that is precisely because they have no foreign competitors in the local market. They exist in a kind of silo here. All of the Chinese here believe their their mobile applications are the best and the most convenient there are. Just like in the USSR, they thought that the Volga was the best car on the planet. But, in fact, it wasn't. Let's take WeChat that people talk about a lot. It's a total disaster. Now, if you, for example, are used to swiping to answer other people's messages, forget it. There is no swiping for you here. There's no such thing. If you're used to quick reactions, putting a like or a smiley on a message, nope, nothing of the sort. There are no video messages. There is a whole lot of these small things missing here. The things we're so used to having in other messengers that we don't even notice they're there and then you open WeChat and you're like oh my god this is some kind of ICQ from like 2007 you know that's what lack of competition can do to the world because WeChat has no rivals in the country they just thought come on people use this thing back in 2007 it was all right it works like a charm why bother changing anything are you kidding me this district is called Shibaitun. Shibaitun? these are the biggest slums in guangzhou very old this place is very close to Guangzhou city center which is why many people who move to Guangzhou especially young people end up settling here the rent is cheap if we go in alleyways you won't see the Sun there although it's shining so bright right now Will and I are going to explore this slum district. Everything remains the same here. Nothing has changed for years. So check it out, guys. This is a Guangzhou slum street. Just look at the space between the houses. I mean, there's another street. This is an intersection. Check out the clearance. The buildings are almost touching each other. We call them handshaking buildings. 
This means that you can shake hands with a guy from another building. The houses stand so close to each other. Yeah, and the neighbors can shake hands. Yes, from different buildings. Most of the buildings are divided into small flats for lease. Now, these slums are the first residence for many hundreds of thousands of working immigrants from other Chinese cities. Now, some of them will find their place under the city's sun and find better accommodation. Others will stay here forever. This is a residential block. Just look at this. Just look, there's a bed in this closet, and there's another bed on the second floor. The man does his trading and sleeps in the same place. And there's a communal toilet for the whole block. There it is. And then there's another closet down there. And there's a bed and people living here. And right here, hold on, let me turn on the light. Here's another closet. The whole room is the size of a bed. And this bed is probably, I don't know, one meter long. You can't even lie down here properly to fully stretch your legs, just so that you understand. I'll try it and lie down on it. So check it out, where my legs are. There's no room whatsoever. I can only lean my legs up against the wall. There's no room to fully stretch out. No way. And the size of it, I mean, look, I stand up. There's the bed, that's it. There is no AC here, of course. More expensive rooms have showers, and sometimes there's a chair and a TV set. Nonetheless, guys, check it out. Even in the slums, look at the door lock. There's no key. It opens by biometric scan only. They want to know who you are. There are many, many, many CCTV cameras. Yeah, I guess it's safe here now, yeah? Yeah. It's not only every corner, but it feels like every brick here is a camera. I mean, there isn't a single tiny spot on this slum map where the cameras would turn a blind eye. From every single angle, you turn around, you see a camera watching you. One camera there, another over there, there's another two there. Over there, I see one, two, three, four cameras. There are literally cameras everywhere. Now, this is interesting, guys. These are ads for flat renting. Look at this. They write on small foam rubber squares. This one is 830 yuan per month. This one is 680 to 800 yuan per month. This one has a balcony. I can't see the price, though. And now take a look at this here. Look at how many there are of these here. There are rent ads everywhere, basically for closets. These are all for guest workers. Living in the slum is much akin to living in a communal flat. Shared kitchen, shared toilet, shared dining room. And this, guys, is what a shared kitchen in the Guangzhou slums looks like. It's a yard. I mean, people live in the little rooms, and everyone has their own kitchen on the patio. Someone is cooking something over there, and others are getting ready to head out to work. Some folks are chilling over there. Hello, hello. Here is another slum building. Once again, a typical layout, an entrance to a block of apartments. And the kitchen is on the ground floor. I mean, it's right here on the stairwell, on the stairs to the second floor. And here on this very staircase, you see the kitchen so that every resident can come down and cook something for themselves. Right, so there, that must be where the toilet is. That's the toilet. Oh, it stinks. Here's another kitchen and the laundry room, washing machines, a sink over there. Somebody's sneakers are drying over there. Oh, guys, it stinks. It's absolutely rancid. And over there, on the floors, are the living quarters. These are the slummiest of slums. There aren't even any coated locks here, so now we're going to go out somewhere onto the rooftop. Oh, I got tangled up with somebody's underpants. Somebody's sneakers are drying there. We're going straight to the rooftop. Whoa. This is more like a dump site than a rooftop. 
It's funny that, although there are so many cameras around here, everything is graded. Check it out. Here, for instance, they have a grate. And behind that grate, there is another grate. And there is a small line of mesh on the glass itself. There are, like, three defense lines there, you know? People decided to set three protection levels. So check it out. First comes a thick grate, and then a thinner one, and then the finest one, so that even a tiny mosquito wouldn't have a chance. And that's the setup on absolutely all of the windows. Three layers of iron grates is a minimum. Those who have more money rent small apartments. Here, guys, check this out. It's a small house. It has cardboard on the floor instead of carpet. This is the first floor. This is the living area. Now, here's the living room with a huge plasma TV. Hello. There's the kitchen. As you can see, it's the bare minimum. A washing machine. The bedrooms are upstairs, I guess, on the second floor. So check it out, guys. Some wealthier guy must have tiled one of the side streets. So there is a social stratification here, too. Now here, guys, are what we call massage therapy services in the slums, if you know what I mean. I'm not going to film inside. YouTube will ban me for it anyway. Also, they could ban me and smash my camera. The slums are literally plagued with scooters. As for locals, the most popular source of income over recent years is not working at a factory, but working for delivery services. All of China's big cities are swarming with so-called kuaidi, or delivery boys. And there is a large scooter charging hub at the entrance to the slum district. Just look at these green crates. These are e-bike charging points. So check it out. There are so many of them. They cook the food here, too, which is then delivered all over the city, and I tried to taste some of it also. What is, uh, what is this called? Soy what is it? milk. You, you drink it, right? Yes. Okay. I got some homemade soy milk in buns. Thank you. Bye-bye. Right, let's uh, take a seat and try them. I didn't buy anything fried because Will warned me about one secret of the Chinese cuisine, or rather, Chinese slum cuisine. This woman over here opens a sewer well and shoves in a huge scoop. The stuff she pours into her bucket will later be taken to the slums. They'll heat it up for fats to rise to the surface. Then they'll skim the fat off the top, put it in barrels, and sell it off to cheap bistros that will use it to cook their stuff. That's why I don't eat here. That's why I don't eat here. They save on everything. That's why they do it. I think the Chinese had this notion of a Chinese stomach. The Chinese stomach is so strong, it can digest anything. This oil is called Tigoyo. Tigoyo means oil that's already been thrown out once. Yeah, so they collect it in these buckets, right? Right. The year is 2022. Employees of a Chongqing hotel are skimming the oil film from a garbage bin. There was once even an international scandal around this gutter oil when it was detected in cosmetic fat sent to Taiwan for producing body cream. The Chinese authorities are actively clamping down on the practice. Some gutter oil producers are even executed, but so far they've been unable to completely stop its production. I think, a lot of, uh, I think many restaurants here use this kind of oil. And, uh, but, uh, but I'm telling you, the Chinese have strong stomachs. We have iron stomachs, we don't care. Oh, guys, it's pretty hot today. So actually, I wanted to get something to drink. It looked like milk or perhaps kefir or yogurt. By the feel of it, firstly, it's warm. Secondly, I suspect that it's not a yogurt at all. Let's try it. Oh. Oh, guys, this is some sort of sweet soy thing. Soy and rice, I guess. 
Homemade soy milk, it turns out, is different from the one you buy at the store, like milk from a cow and from a carton. By the way, when it's hot, the Chinese prefer warm drinks as they believe it will let you cool down faster. All right, let's try these buns now. Now, I asked for one, just to be clear. This is one. One portion, I guess that means. I mean, I don't know. This is a portion for an elephant. I can't imagine how the Chinese can eat so much in one go, with the average Chinese person being around 20% smaller than me. Jokes aside, it's incredible. The Chinese enjoy their meals. They usually have big portions, including rice, noodles, pork, all fairly high calorie meals. But you'll hardly ever meet an overweight person in the street. So we're gonna do an episode about the delicious Chinese cuisine pretty soon. Mmm. Mm. I thought these were just dough balls, but guys, I think they have rice noodles inside. Who's knocking over there? Could you please stop that? I mean, what's the point? Oh, seems like you got the message. When you look at it, they don't look very nice. But when you taste them... This is a really decent pie, I have to say. It's funny, but most of the property owners in these slums are in fact millionaires, even though they rent out these huts for pennies. These are real money millionaires, multi-millionaires at that. Now, those who have a bed-sized apartment here, in a few years, in two to three years, 10 years at most, they'll be able to exchange it for a spacious flat in a huge new residential complex that will probably be built here sooner or later. Under Chinese law, developers must provide accommodation on exactly the same land where the occupant slums were located. Only by that time, there will be a skyscraper with million-dollar apartments. So another option for developers is to pay the residents off, in that case offering not the current value of the hut, but the value of the apartment in the elite building to be. Strictly speaking, these slums are still here only because there's no construction company that has come forward yet with enough money to pay all the local residents and buy them out of their apartments. When it comes to relocation, the owners will always ask for more. In our next episode, I'll show you a man from Shanghai who is asking for $5 million for his closet apartment. Let them pay me first. Money first, and it'll be smooth sailing. Until then, I'll live here just fine. He lives with his wife like this, waiting for his five million bucks. In fact, there's only one room here. The bed is on the floor, made of some boards with some structure on top, with some people sleeping there too. And that's, that's it. That's the entire apartment. Quite often, there is this one last man standing who refuses to leave the slums, driving a hard bargain right until the end. Sometimes he gets lucky and gets more millions. And sometimes they simply build the new stuff around the stubborn owner's property. For example, this is a highway built around a hut. And here is a traffic circle around an old house. There are many cases just like this. It may seem funny, but in fact, it demonstrates the authority's serious attitude to private property. In China, you cannot simply take it, even if you want to build a critical highway instead of a slum. This, guys, is the heart of Shenzhen, the Golden Land. Well, no, not gold. Gold is too cheap for this. It's platinum. It's diamond. Let's say apartments in those high-rise buildings start at one and a half million dollars and then skyrocket into outer space. And here, right next to these incredibly expensive apartments, there is the largest slum district in the city, a ghetto for workers. Let's go. Check out the rides in this place. Guys, here is a normal parking lot in the Shenzhen slums. There's a Land Cruiser, a Mercedes, a Cadillac over there, a Lexus. BYD is a top Chinese electrical vehicle. Oh, and check it out. That's how they deal with bad parking. They stick these warnings on their windshields. Another Mercedes. Ah, V-Turbo. What a beauty, right? 
a BMW, a Neo, an expensive Chinese e-car. Again, a BMW, a Mercedes, one more Mercedes, and that is how Shenzhen slum residents live. I have a friend in China. He's Chinese. The building he lived in was to be demolished. They offered him $2 million for his apartment. $2 million? For an old one, like the one you just saw. You see, they're all in the same place, in the same district with skyscrapers all around. I said, $2 million is cool. You could, well, your parents could buy one or two apartments in Shenzhen and there would still be some money left. You know what he told me? He told me that a new apartment in the new building that is to be erected here will cost four to five million dollars. He said better we wait and resell if the chance arises. You mean that all these residents of these slums... They're waiting. Sooner or later they'll get a yeah. seven-figure dollar transfer to their accounts. Yeah, they're waiting. And they'll definitely get it. Wow, guys, I mean, with this setup, living in the slums, it's not such a bad idea, right? I mean, if you know that you're going to be a millionaire in the next three years yeah. or ten years, max. Well, we had a story here in Shenzhen, the most expensive spot, the slums too. Everything was horrible there. There was a god-awful stench from the sewers. It was the most expensive spot because down there, people got five to seven million dollars for their old apartments. In China, as it's well known, they build stuff fast and in large quantities. So fast and in such quantities that while apartments in big city centers cost millions of dollars, these suburbs are haunted by these new ghost builds. Unlike most ghost towns on Earth that appear because people haven't moved out of them yet, these ghost towns appear because people have yet to move into them. There are two sides to that problem. On the one hand, it's a big problem for construction companies and recently almost triggered a crisis throughout the whole Chinese economy. One of the biggest local developers simply couldn't sell everything it built and accumulated a lot of debt. On the other hand, for many ordinary Chinese citizens, it means that there is a vast supply on the housing market, which drives down prices. And in some regions, even people with minimal salaries can save up for a flat in two years. I mean, just think about it, where you're living now, if someone earns minimum wages, couriers, porters, would they be able to put aside all their income and save up for a flat in two years? We are in the city of Huizhou, Huizhou. by the seaside. Well, seaside apartments are the cheapest ones in China. Huizhou is located an hour away from the heart of China's Silicon Valley. This is our guy. Uh huh. We're visiting a realtor to get a feel of flat prices in the Shenzhen suburbs. New builds are on offer by the seashore. Right here, a house by the sea. That building? Yeah, one of these buildings. Guys, how much do you think a one roomer will cost? A one roomer by the coastline. We're gonna go to the flat with a realtor. The Chinese, even if they've used their car for a long time, they don't peel off the protective covers from the polished parts, so they can avoid scratches. He's guiding us to a flat, which in fact has three rooms, because in China, only the bedroom counts as a room. Aha, uh -huh. so this is a room, right? A room which does not uh, count okay, here in China. Okay, a room which doesn't count here in China. There is another kid's room with a bed. What do we have here? We have... The kitchen. Okay, the kitchen. I get comments like, why are the kitchens in China so small? People don't have meals in the kitchen in China. They cook a meal and bring it over here to eat. Uh-huh. And another bedroom with a bed with huge windows, almost French windows, in fact. How much does this cost? When you bring hard cash, I think you could haggle it down to 280,000, 270,000. Also, Shenzhen is an expensive city with large revenues. The average annual salary, based on various estimates, is 155,000 to 181,000 yuan. This means a working husband and wife could save up for a place in several months and not only get an apartment, but also this cool territory. This is a courtyard in a cheap residential property in China. But you can hardly call it cheap. But these are the cheapest flats in the Shenzhen suburbs. I mean, seriously. 
homes that cost roughly the same as a mass segment Chinese car. And check out the adjacent territory around these buildings. It just looks incredible. I mean, just look at the size of this children's playground. I mean, it's like an enormous amusement park in the courtyard of, and I'll say this again, the cheapest residential complex. You've got your own swimming pool with a sea view. You see, right there, you have the sea. There's fresh water here and then salt water over there. So you don't buy these apartments forever, right? Um, you buy them for like 70 years, huh? Yeah, but there are places for 40 years. The thing is that 70 years is the maximum real estate ownership term in China. The same system is in place, for instance, in Singapore, where almost all real estate is sold for 69 years. Theoretically, these buildings will not last that long. So whatever happens, the time will come when they either get renovated or let's say they're knocked down. That could also be the case. Just to be clear, in China, they built skyscrapers designed to last 50 years. Because in 50 years, this skyscraper will be knocked down and a new one will be built? The time hasn't come yet. We'll know in 30 years. <laughs> so if they demolish your house, does the new flat they give you have to be similar? They either give you a house in the same spot, they build new houses, new flats in this location, or you choose the money. But they offer real good money. This is a typical entrance to any Chinese residential block. The entire territory is fenced off. There's a checkpoint guarded by a police officer or a specially trained individual. Quite often you can notice these special boxes that are used for delivering items ordered in online stores so that ultimately you don't have to wait for the courier to arrange a meeting time with them. They just deliver it for you. They leave it here and then you come down, take your package and you're done. In China, several buildings that are fenced in are called a garden. All right, guys, we're going to film some prices in a Chinese store. This is a standard supermarket. The prices are moderate here. I mean, it's not some elite store. Okay, let's start with milk, a carton of standard milk, 24 yuan. No, here's a cheaper one. 19 yuan. Uh, even a bit lower, 18.6 yuan. Uh, here is some sausage for you. This 200 gram pack costs 33 yuan. Some chips here. Well, check it out. These are nice. 15.5 yuan. Apples. Oh, no, those aren't apples. Those are quinces, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, six yuan. Uh, eight yuan uh, for each. And that's for half a kilo. And that's right, guys. Watch out. That's for half a kilo. In Chinese supermarkets, the price tags indicate the price for half a kilo, not a kilo. So be careful. Tomatoes. Four yuan for these. These are more expensive ones, 5 yuan, but again for half a kilo. This means 10 yuan per kilo. Small potatoes, the good stuff, 4 yuan for half a kilo, 8 yuan for a kilo. Alex came to China 17 years ago. He owns a Russian cuisine restaurant. When I first came here, they used phones without screens. Since then, a lot has changed in China. Huge megacities sprung up. Many gigantic local brands emerged. Nearly 800 million Chinese citizens climbed above the poverty line. Now China is a country with a large middle class. The Chinese mindset has not changed. The mentality hasn't changed? Only the younger generation, the one that's growing up. For them, it's more about games. They're phone zombies staring at their screens. Working is hard for them. They don't know how to work. So this whole stereotype about the uber hardworking Chinese is about those age 30 plus, right? Actually, I recently came across some statistics by Bloomberg and the like. China is trying to keep it a secret. 30% of Chinese aged 16 to 26 are unemployed or have just got hired. So they have a very high unemployment percentage globally because they're all hooked on games or they make video blogs. And I can't really say whether there is any money in it. 
Okay, well, that's what I'm saying. The hardworking are Chinese who are 30 and older because traditionally the Chinese are... 50 to 60 plus. 60 plus. Yeah. Our best worker is a lady who washes the dishes and makes dumplings. She's a jack of all trades. And I've heard from other guys in companies that the best worker is usually some old man who performs all his duties, comes to work one hour early, leaves one hour late, and helps everybody else who makes a mistake. This means these grandpas and grandmas are the people who have created the modern China over the last 40 years. So over the years that you've lived here, what was the most drastic change in China? China is constantly changing. Let me give you an example. I live and do business around Shenzhen on a daily basis. I didn't pass by one district for a month, and when I did, there was a new street, a new building, a new shopping mall. I don't know, they're eternally building bridges, so China is evolving all the time. Max and I are going back to Shenzhen for him to show me how the Chinese counterfeit smartphone market works. There are even some original boxes here. Original boxes with original seals, even legit IMEIs. If Apple catches wind of what's going on here, they're all gonna go bald like me. But this is a story for another episode on China. Mind you, they used to say that if something is made in China, it's the bad stuff. We've just passed by Haiti Lab, a chain of Chinese drink stores, but it's very well made, right? We just dropped in. Ah, like a Chinese coffee house, right? It's classy. Take Huawei. Check out all the drama. A Neo store. Neo cars have high quality, but high prices too. Huawei's are no cheaper than iPhones either. There used to be no well-recognized Chinese brands, and now a lot of them are springing up. Here's a DGI store, for instance. So you mean that Chinese brands are rapidly growing bigger globally, right? Popular globally. And this is only the beginning of their rise in the foreign market. So you think this is only the beginning? This isn't like the end? I mean, they haven't reached their limit yet? The beginning happened long ago. It has been largely fueled by the country itself, their country. China has helped them develop and they have achieved their success. Now they're expanding to global markets. So, but everybody says that China is slowing down and this whole growth era is over. Why are you laughing? No comment in here slowing down just look around you man slowing down you buildings pop up here every week i mean come on so you mean as if you try to slow down like this well it must be some kind of joke right slowing down it's what everyone says i'm laughing so hard i'm crying nah come off it i mean slowing down <laughs> So what do you think? Is China slowing down or is it vice versa, picking up speed? In our second episode, I'll be showing how the Chinese province lives. Two foreigners in the middle of nowhere in an RV fucking cruising. We'll take a peek at real life in a Shaolin temple. As you clench your fist, the master is watching you. If you clench it like this, you see thumbs on the ground, that's it. You can get a baton smack on the back like instantly. I was astonished at what I heard from the monks in training. And I'll show you Shanghai, a Shanghai that you have never seen in your life. So subscribe to my channel so you don't miss out. I'll answer your comments myself. All right, we're heading out.